Welcome to the Unconditionally Worthy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Adia Gooden, a licensed clinical psychologist who believes deeply that you are worthy unconditionally. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Unconditionally Worthy Podcast. This is such a timely episode. I have Dr. Amber Thornton with me, talking with me today about balance in motherhood. She has a community called Balance Working Mama, and I'm recording this on a day when I'm feeling pretty tired and a little bit stressed. Last night was sort of tough. Baby girl Imani Joy was up a lot, and so I'm a bit sleep deprived. Our nanny that we hired, which we're, who we're really excited about, let us know that unfortunately she can't start next week. She has to start the week afterwards. So child care is a bit um, challenging next week. So I'm feeling sort of this stress of being back in my business and working and recording podcasts, which I do love to do, while also taking care of Amani and just trying to balance all of those things. And I'm certainly not in it alone. Jason is here. My parents were here this week. Uh, Jason's mom, my mother-in-law has been here. Um, And so we have help and I'm feeling somewhat stressed and out of balance. I'm trying to practice a lot of self-compassion and be gracious and patient with myself and know that this is a period of time that is going to pass. And I was really grateful to be able to talk to Dr. Amber Thornton today about how we find balance in motherhood and how we, you know, move beyond trying to prove our worthiness um, as mothers. So I'm excited about this episode today. I know that you'll get so much out of it. So let's dive in. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Amber Thornton on the podcast today. I've been following her for a while on Instagram and um, really just excited to have a conversation with her about motherhood and how we can find balance and wellness in motherhood, especially since I am a new mother myself. So let me tell you a little bit about Uh, Dr. Amber Thornton. She is a licensed clinical psychologist and motherhood and wellness consultant. She is the founder of Balanced Working Mama, where the mission is to completely change the narrative of what's possible for millennial working mothers by helping them to better balance work, motherhood, and wellness. Balanced Working Mama's community continues to grow as more mamas are leaning in Leaning, learning how to re- redefine balance in motherhood and truly begin to prioritize their needs and desires first. Dr. Amber Thornton is dedicated to sharing tips, strategies, and mindset shifts for balancing work, motherhood, and wellness weekly on the Balanced Working Mama podcast. Dr. Thornton also helps working mamas to transform their wellness through the Balanced Working Mama community, a virtual wellness community that supports millennial mamas in finding the balance and wellness in motherhood through any season of the journey. Dr. Thornton resides in Washington, D.C. with her husband and two children who are incredibly adorable, which I know from Instagram. And she is deeply passionate about helping other working mothers fulfill their goals, passions, and find more joy throughout their motherhood experiences. So welcome, Dr. Amber. I am so grateful to have you here. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this. Like This is going to be a really good conversation. So I'm just happy to be here. Awesome. And I was telling Dr. Amber before we started that this is a very timely conversation to have because I'm in, I guess, sort of my second week post maternity leave. Uh, you know, child care has been a little bit wonky starting out. And so, um, you know, I'm definitely feeling the challenge of striking a balance or finding some balance um, in terms of being a new mom and working and doing all of the things. So I'm really excited to hear your wisdom um, that you have to share. And I know that I'm going to take a lot from our conversation today. Um, And I'd love for us to start where I start all of um, my podcast episodes is by asking you to share about your own self-worth journey. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's that's such a great question. And I actually took some time to really think about this. And for me, I think my self-worth journey has just been a work in progress since I was probably a child. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I don't know how many of your listeners can relate to this, but I have always been this very high achieving person, even in childhood. That's 
that's why I became a doctor. And that's why I, you know, I, I was the first in many rights in my family to do many things. You know, the first to go to college, the first to go to graduate mm. school, the first to move away from home, you know, the first mm. to do all these things. Um, and so for me, what I noticed is that my self-worth was often tied into what I was able to accomplish or what I was able to produce, um, how I've been able to perform. And so I think that has just been, you know, an evolution for me. My self-worth journey is me realizing that my worth has nothing to do with how much I'm able Mm -hmm. to do, you know, for other people, how much I'm able to produce. And it has just continued to evolve in every stage of life that I've been in. So for Mm -hmm. instance, right after graduate school, you know, I had to learn like, okay, Yes, you have this doctor, but that's not where your worth lies. Like you, you mm-hmm. always had worth. You always had value in it. it. It, it has not changed because now you get to be doctor. And now in motherhood, you know, I'm realizing, you know, oh, okay, so my worth is not really tied to how how good of a day I had as a mom today. <laughs> um, you know, I could have the worst mm-hmm. day ever with my kids and still have worth and value. And so, you know, that all of that is just kind of continuing to evolve as I take steps in life. And and that's that's what it is for me. It's still a work in progress. You know, me Mm. really understanding that my worth has very little to do with the roles and the responsibilities I hold and everything to do with just who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of listeners can relate. I can certainly relate to your experience of finding worth in achievement, um, academic achievement in particular. I know, you know, a real turning point for me was, you know, right after I defended my dissertation and sort of realized like, oh, this that, that wasn't going to do it for me. Yep. <laughs> you know, like, you know, spent years like, okay, that's going to be the thing. That's the yeah. final like goal. And then I'll feel worthy and then I'll feel good enough and got out of that room and was like, ooh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, didn't do it. Um, and so I totally relate to that. And I, you know, I think also just entering into motherhood, and I know that this is something you talk about, about a lot, is that, you know, women are often taught to believe your being a mother gives you worth, right? Like you're worthy as a mother. And then there's the sort of how to be a perfect mom, right? Or to do all the things. And now in our generation, like work and, you know, be the perfect mom at home and sort of do more of all the things. And it's really easy to get caught up in feeling like that is what makes you worthy or kind of end up engaging in motherhood, I think, in a way that's sort of oriented in the same way that we can engage in academics, which is sort of striving and achievement and, you know, checking boxes, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I don't, I personally don't think is the most healthy way for us to engage in this, this aspect of our lives and our identities. Agreed. Agreed. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate because if we're not aware of it, we'll just pass that right on to our kids and Mm -hmm. they'll continue that cycle with their kids. And we just, we really don't want that. You know, we really don't. So Yes, everything you said is, is so true. And I, I I love that we're having conversations like this because there might be someone who has not realized that that's what's been happening for them. And mm-hmm. now they just leave this conversation a little bit more aware and really thinking about well, what was the next steps for me. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you could share um, specifically about kind of what aspects of self-worth were uncovered for you or came up for you um, as you became a mother? And you know, now you're a mother to two little ones, right? Like how do you sort of navigate your feelings of worthiness in, you know, in connection with motherhood? Um, what does that look like for you? Yes, that's so, that's a good, another great question. You know, I think for me, I grew up and again, this might be relatable to you all too. I grew up watching my mom really be the person that did most of the things in my household. Mm. Um, you know, I we did grow up with my dad. My dad was also in the household. But the way that things worked back then, you know, there was very traditional roles in terms of this was what she was supposed to do and this is what he was supposed to do. And unfortunately, mm. this was really not even. And mm. so, you know, I think for me growing up and becoming a mother, But then also, and so another layer I'll throw in is that I'm also a a married 
support woman. I have a, a spouse. And so for me, I quickly realized, oh, my spouse is very engaged, very active, very supportive. And so this idea of what I thought motherhood should be is, is automatically going to be very different. Mm-hmm. And I started to realize there was a sense of me that was like, wait, but if I'm not doing all the things, then what does that mean for me mm-hmm. as a mom? You know, am I still mm-hmm. going to have the same word? You know, is it okay for me to not be, you know, like this default parent or this primary parent? Is is that okay? And so mm-hmm. I just started to feel all of that kind of come up. And so even in, as I kind of like, and y'all, I'm still a new mom. I, my, my oldest is three years old. And so I'm still, (laughs) I'm still learning and growing. And so I think another thing I've learned is that with me being so vocal about wanting and needing help, Mm -hmm. I've had to kind of like often balance this desire for like, yes, I need help. Yes. I need to assert myself. But then also this, this other thing in the back of my mind is like, Hmm, there's other women who do this by themselves. And so what does that say about you? You know what I mean? You know, that there's other women who who do this better than you. And so, mm. it's, you know, it's like constantly battling that chatter in your head that says that you should be doing more, you should be doing it better. You know, you're mm. not doing enough. I think that is something that moms in particular, especially women of color and black moms, we battle all the time. Yeah. All the time. It's, it's like, if it's not someone else saying it to us, then it's us. And, and most times it's us. <laughs> it's us saying it to ourselves. <laughs> no one else is saying right. it. It's right. us. And so, you know, that has been, you know, how it's kind of also unfolded for me as a mom in my journey, you know, just constantly reminding myself that it is okay for me to not do everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it is okay for me to not do this with excellence all the time. You know what I mean? Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. All of that is okay. Um, And that has been really pivotal for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're so right, right? Like how we're socialized, what we see our moms doing growing up definitely makes a difference. I think, you know, the other thing that is coming up for me as I sort of am in this new stage of motherhood is sort of, balancing desires because I do on one level have this desire to be available to nurse my daughter whenever she wants to nurse because I really enjoy breastfeeding and it's this special time and it's this connected, you know, this point of connection. And I know that if I don't step away or, you know, take time for myself or let somebody else feed her that in the long term that creates these challenges, right? Because one, I'm going to need a break or I'm going to need to step away. And so it also feels like this tension between wanting to be there and wanting to be present, right? So there's the the desire that's not totally based in like, am I good enough? But like, I really love this time and it's special and it's precious. And how do I take care of myself at the same other time? hand because I I need that time. And then there's a layer of what do other people think about that? And so it, it's there's a lot of tension and pulls while you're also sleep deprived. I'm sleep deprived, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so how do you, you know, sorting through all of this in the, as you go through it is challenging. And I, you know, I imagine that's one of the big benefits of your community um, mm-hmm. for moms, because it's, it's a lot to sort of sort through. Um, and it can be so easy to just kind of just get swept up on whatever is happening versus Mm -hmm. trying Mm -hmm. to slow down and move with intention. Yes, absolutely. And so I have two, two, two responses to that. Um, you know, one being, this is why I always advocate for moms to, to prioritize your own needs, like just Mm -hmm. very bluntly put yourself first above your children. And that sounds so hard and so scary, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think there's a lot of like perceived judgment, you know, people are afraid like, okay, well, what are people going to think of me if they know that that's how I'm living my life? You know, are they going to think that I'm like a neglectful parent or that I'm so Mm -hmm. or that, you know, there's all this guilt, but I think that is so important because it is so easy for us to slip into this mold of prioritizing everybody else and we completely forget about ourselves. And so, you know, this radical shift of putting your own needs first, putting yourself in the center is really just like insurance to like Mm. ensure (laughs) that you will think about yourself. It's not saying that 
everybody else's needs matter less. It's not saying that you are more important, even though I argue, I think we are more important because <laughs> if, we, if we are not well, we can't take care of anyone, you know, mm-hmm. but it really is just like this insurance policy of like me putting myself in the middle will ensure that I won't forget about myself because you absolutely will if you are not being intentional about it. But what you said about the community, that is why this community is so important. Um, You know, having a community of other moms who also want to be well, who want to be healthy, who want to have balance. Um, It will help you when you are feeling like there's not a lot of clarity in your own brain because you are sleep deprived, because you have so many things going on. Having these other people around you who are cheering you on, supporting you, having similar messages, kind of like, you get to be in the mix of that, even if you feel like you can't do it on your own. And so being able to look out at other people who are maybe examples of how they're doing it or who are also desperately wanting the same thing. So you all will align just in terms of your mindset and your beliefs and your desires. That is so helpful. I've been talking about this a lot more because I, even I'm coming to realize the power of this community that I have. You know, it it really is, just imagine yourself in a room full of people who um, really just want the opposite of what you want. You mm-hmm. will eventually go down the path of those people. And it's not mm-hmm. good or bad it's just that, you know, cause you'll only be in a room full of people who are saying these things, wanting these things, you know, believing these things. But if you're in a room full of people who are aligned with all the things you want, then you get to hear that and see that and see mm-hmm. and, Feel that and taste that, be a part of that. And that will only push you further in the direction you want to go. So I I think that's why that's the community is so important, but also like, you know, moms really boldly, boldly, boldly Mm. practice this idea of like, I have to put myself first because if I don't, it's it's only going to be bad for me moving forward. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think that's really powerful and somewhat radical, like put yourself first. And, you know, it makes me think about you know, often in families, everybody else is putting themselves first, right? Like kids are putting themselves first because they don't have any other way of being, right? Like if they're hungry, they're going to tell you they're hungry. If they're tired, right? Like they are going to say, I want my needs met. They're not going to say, oh, mom, I'm going to wait until you finish in the bathroom and then I'll get hungry and cry. No, like they're putting their needs first. Often if you have a male partner, they're probably putting their needs Absolutely. first and not necessarily in a selfish way, but like that's, that's how they're socialized, mean. right? Yeah. Like men are usually socialized to think about themselves first mm-hmm. and then they'll take care of their family and they can be amazing fathers and husbands while doing that. Um, yeah. I'm not trying to put them down, but that's, you know, so they're that's probably going to do that. And so then if in that ecosystem, the mom is the only one who's not putting her needs first then it just creates a situation where her needs aren't going to get met because there's almost always somebody who needs her. There's almost always some demand. And so I think, you know, your guidance is so important to say, no, literally put your needs first, center yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about this in the work I've done with clients, which is most of the clients are so worried about being too selfish. I'm like, you're never going to get there, right? Like you've, prioritizing yourself, like is going to even things out. It's not going to put you in a space where you're totally selfish and you don't care about anybody else. And so I imagine the same of your wisdom. It's like center yourself. And actually that's going to balance things out versus exactly making you just, you know, the center of attention and the only person who gets their needs met in the family. Yes. Because the funny thing about it is, you know, the people who, um, are neglecting their children, you know, not caring. They are not aware of it. But like many of us, we are we are hyper aware of, you know, um, you know, how selfish we may or may not be, you know, or the needs of our children. And so that right there will let you know. Like if you are afraid to put yourself first because you're afraid of what it means spiritually, that means there's absolutely no way. Like you will never neglect your family. <laughs> you're, that's not that's not likely to happen. And so that's something that I often have to really like break down for moms. You know, I remember a few weeks, months ago, I I said that on Instagram and a lot of women were really shocked and unhappy about it. And I got to Mm. talk to a few of them. And what they said was, you know, when you say that you have to put yourself first, that makes me feel like you're neglecting your children or that I'm Mm. neglecting. And we had to really have a conversation about 
putting yourself first does not equate to neglect for anyone. And and I think, again, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because I, I really want moms to understand this. You know, centering your own needs really helps to bring more balance to the whole picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I also think about, you know, the challenge of living in a culture that is sort of this zero sum culture, right? So like I, if you're fr- if somebody is first, that means everybody else is last, right? Mm-hmm. Or if somebody is the winner, everybody else is the loser. And I think when we have that orientation, the idea of putting yourself first seems really problematic because it means you're putting your child's needs last or you're just ignoring them. And that's not what you're saying, mm-hmm. right? You're just saying, consider your needs first, right? Right. Before you consider everybody else's needs, you're still going to consider everybody else's needs, Mm -hmm. but you're going to put yours at the forefront instead of ignoring them, right? So thinking about that, and I also think there's probably a way in which when you center your needs, you're also helping your children and family members to learn to meet other people's needs, right? Because so many of us are socialized in families where the girls or the women are the only ones who are focused on meeting everybody else's needs. But it's so important for everybody in the ecosystem to be sort of aware of their own needs and other people's needs and to not sort of over index on one or the other. And so if the mother is saying, here are my needs, how do we make sure those are met in addition to other people's needs? Everybody is learning and understanding, oh, this is healthy, right? It isn't just all about me. Right. Yeah. Or it isn't all about someone else. We all need to balance this. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I talk about that often too. me communicating my boundaries to my children, helping them understand that, you know, mommy's not always happy or sometimes mommy doesn't want to play. It helps them realize that I'm human, too. You know, mm-hmm. and that is an important lesson. You know, we have to help our children see and understand that we have needs, we have desires. Sometimes we feel pain. Um, of mm-hmm. course, within reason, we don't want our, our children to ever feel responsible for our feelings or any of that, but really helping them understand that mommy is a human just like you. And, mm-hmm. um, this is, this is how the world works. This is how our relationships work. This is how connection with other people works too. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges, right? In your, in the community of, of mothers that you work with and, you know, your audience, what are the, some of the biggest challenges you see people having with sort of taking care of themselves um, as they are mothering, as they are being mothers? Yep. So outside of what we just talked about, cause that's a huge one. Um, <laughs> um, I think guilt You know, this idea Mm -hmm. of mom guilt is what we often call it, you know, feeling guilty about, um, you know, taking a moment for yourself or doing something for yourself. Um, That guilt is a huge one because it often for many women is the determining factor for whether they're going to um, make a decision about their wellness or make a decision Mm -hmm. about their health. You know, for them, Mm -hmm. they kind of read it as, well, if I feel guilt, that means I shouldn't do it. But Mm -hmm. the way that I I help women and mothers understand it is that when you feel guilt, you you have to be very critical about it because honestly, 99% of the time that mom guilt is wrong. It is Mm -hmm. wrong. And so guilt is an emotion that helps us understand when maybe we might have done something wrong or, you know, something Mm -hmm. right. But when it comes to motherhood and when it comes to your, your well-being and your health, often that, that indicator is just kind of off a little bit. So I help them really be more critical about that guilt that they're feeling. And Mm -hmm. instead of stopping when they feel the guilt to actually just move forward, like move Mm -hmm. into it (laughs) because Mm -hmm. there's growth and healing behind that. You know, for instance, if you've been having guilt about wanting to plan a, a vacation with your friends, you know, go away for mm. a weekend, um, there is growth and healing behind that guilt. If you just, you got to get through it, you got to do it so you can mm-hmm. go on that trip. And you learn so much more, you grow so much more as a mother and a woman when you're able to do those things for yourself. So the guilt, but then also, I think another big thing that a lot of the moms struggle with is really being very vocal about their needs and when they might mm. need more support. Um, mm. Like just really communicating with other people about what they need, 
how they need it. Um, really asking for that help is just really hard for them because again, many of them have been socialized to believe that if you need help, you're you're not trying hard enough. You know, if you mm. need help, it's because you you haven't thought through all the options of how you can do this alone, or mm. if you need help. Uh, you shouldn't even go that route because people don't know how to help you anyway, you know? And so there's mm. a lot of really negative beliefs about help, what it means about you, but then also other people's desire and ability to help that we often have to work through too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the first part of what you said with the guilt is so important, right? Like, okay, feel the guilt and still do the thing that you know is going to be good for you and going to be helpful. And the hope is that people, you know, go on that trip or, you know, take a day for themselves and then find that they can maybe even be more present when they come back because they've had the rest, they've had the restoration, they've had the break. And, you know, I try to think about, you know, I've worked with young adults a lot and, you know, in the conversations with them, if they had concerns about their parents and many of them did, <laughs> it was never like my parent went away for one weekend or took a few hours or had a hobby, right? Like that's not the complaint. The complaint is my parent was critical. My parent was overwhelmed. My parent was depressed. My parent had a substance abuse issue. My parent didn't approve of me, right? Those core things are the things that really impact our, our children. But if in general, you're there, you're present, you're loving, you're accepting, you're warm, having a few days away, a few hours away, right? Like that yeah. is not, your child is not going to come through that thinking, my parent doesn't love me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't cause that psychological impact. That's yeah. not what happens. And so, you know, I know that that's a helpful reminder for me. And I hope that that helps, you know, other people to hear that, like your child is not going to be in a therapist's office in 20 years because you went on a girl's trip for a exactly. weekend. <laughs> not at all. They're they are not. <laughs> in fact, they're going to be like, I saw my mom go on girls trips and I want to do that myself. I mm -hmm. learned that it was good to rest and play and have fun and that you could do that even when you were an adult and a parent. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if I, I'm imagining too, they'll say like, I saw that when she did that, she came back, she was, she was happy. She felt, she seemed satisfied. She was, it, it was easier to talk to her. And so like, I'm learning that when I do those things, I feel better and I'm able to be closer connected with people that those are really important lessons for, for us and our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think the other thing about sort of asking for help, you know, we do motherhood very different in the U.S. than most cultures, right? Most cultures who have done this have sort of an established, you know, centuries old way of doing motherhood. And when I was still pregnant, I was sort of reading about the postpartum period and reading some books that sort of talked about how different cultures around the world handle the postpartum period. And a lot in a lot of cultures, basically the new mom doesn't do anything but nurse the baby. Yep. Like she sleeps. She nurses the baby and somebody else feeds her, makes her food, cleans. And it's just like, do not do anything. That's like, that's the way it's supposed to be versus I think in the U.S. culture, it's like, how quickly can you get out and get a run? How quickly can you get out there? How could, you know, and you're supposed to do anything. You have maybe a few weeks of maternity leave and your partner probably doesn't have leave at the same time. And so you're supposed to be home alone with the baby and cooking and cleaning. And it's just... It's a recipe for a big problem. Yeah. I, my, you know, my sort of clinical opinion is that, yeah, it makes sort of sense why we have high rates of postpartum depression, because yeah. if that's your launch into motherhood, which is totally overwhelming, it makes sense that you might come through that feeling depressed and overwhelmed and anxious and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I think even for people to remember, like, this is not like the way we do it is not normal. Actually, most communities and cultures, most moms have a whole ton of support, mm -hmm. right? Like have grandmothers and aunts and all these people who are in the mix of caring for the children. And you are not, it's not intended to be a solo endeavor. And you're really not proving anything by trying to do it alone, especially if you have access to support. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that was so key, like really, like you said, getting us to kind of like step outside of our own box and seeing that there's so many other ways of doing this. And, you know, that's also why I love our community, because it's a way for us to I always say, like, redefine what motherhood looks like. You know, many of us have only seen that version of motherhood that is very 
American and, and westernized and, you know, the mom and the woman always doing everything. It's like, well, no wonder she was stressed out. No wonder she was overwhelmed. Like it's literally too much, <laughs> too much. And so, you know, getting us to accept and understand that there absolutely can be another way that we can work towards this. And it's going to be um, it's going to take some work to like stretch our mindsets around it, our our beliefs, you know, our habits and practices and how we even navigate our families, but there there can be a better a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there are practices that you offer to the moms that you support and work with that you find helpful. And I'm sort of thinking about this in the context of just we're touching on it, but the complexity of motherhood, which may be that you really, really, really wanted to get pregnant and have a child and then you have one and then you're overwhelmed and you're anxious or you're experiencing all these things and you're like, what is this, right? Like, is it something wrong with me? How do I take time away? I wanted this child so much. Maybe you didn't plan the child, but then you, right? Like there's so many complex, like, I love being with my kid, but I need a break and I can't, you know, there's so many complexities. And I think we're often not um, practiced in holding the complexity together and, and not saying, oh, this means I'm a bad mom, right? But like, oh, there are times when I really just want to get away. And there are times when I love my child so much, I don't want to let them go. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And that all of that is together. It doesn't mean, you know, one is right and one is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm sort of asking a, a convoluted question, but I'm just sort of wondering if there are practices that you offer that help people help moms to navigate the complexities, mm -hmm. the emotional complexities of motherhood. Yeah. You know, I think the, First thing it made me think about is in our community, we practice something called the balanced framework. And it's mm -hmm. really just a framework to help us understand what balance means. But it's also like this new spin on how to think about balance. Because I think traditionally, when we think of the word balance, we think of, you know, like equal parts and things, um, you know, things feeling equal and smooth and kind of like harmonious. And that is okay. That's a good definition of it. But, you know, we've taken that word and really redefined it. And there are eight principles that we really try to ground ourselves in. And, you know, I think that one, that also, you know, doing it that way kind of calls out the complexity of this motherhood thing. You know, it, it is complex. And so it might take some principles to ground us in so that we're, you know, not aiming for perfection with these things, but really kind of like understanding, well, which direction should I be looking? Which direction, how should I, you know, what perspective might be helpful for me and not. Hmm. Um, and so some of the principles in that framework include, you know, really making sure that you're very bold and firm in, in how you set your boundaries, um, hmm. you know, really being very clear about how you're communicating with people when it comes to your needs, um, really making space for living fully in all of your identities. And, and that one is really special to me. Hmm. It, it essentially means that when you become a mom, that's not just it. Like there's still these other mm. parts of you that exist, even if it feels like you've lost touch or connection with them. Like it's still important to, to really fully live in all of who you are. Um, you know, another example is really learning how to, to delegate roles and responsibilities mm. in your house and or collaborate more. And so for some of the moms in our community, this means them um, exploring what outsourcing means for them, you know, paid mm. services. For a lot of them, this means like, reshifting the roles and responsibilities in their house so that their spouse is playing a different role or even their older children, you know, and I'm mm. my, kid, my, my oldest child is three. And there's things that we expect and, and expect for him to do when it comes to responsibility. So, you know, that, um, so that I think is a, a cool practice and really helping to ground them in, you know, well, what does balance mean? What does that look like? Mm. Like, what are the, the foundational things that I should kind of keep in my mind to help guide my decisions and my, my daily habits and my practices as I, I go through each day? Hmm. Yeah, I think that sounds so helpful. And I think it's also, it seems like it's about people figuring out for themselves, right? So you have yeah. a framework that guides exactly. people into like, here's what you should be considering in these different areas. And Absolutely. it's not like you're saying, these should be your boundaries or this should be how roles and responsibilities are done in your household, but encouraging mm -hmm. people to think about 
what will work for you, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And then how do you sort of have the tools to implement those things? Absolutely. Because it will look different for everyone. And that's, you know, one thing I know about moms and especially moms in my community. It's such a diverse and eclectic group. Like we're all very different. You know, we have different kids and different needs and we live in different places. Some of us are married. Mm -hmm. Some of us are single. Some of us have multiples. Some of us have one kid. Like it's, it's all different depending on what your lifestyle is, what your circumstances are, but then also even within your own life, things can look different this month than next month. And so, yes, it's going to look different for everybody, but these very common core, you know, principles and, and considerations to really be keeping in mind to help, to help you find that balance and wellness. Yeah, that sounds, it sounds incredibly helpful. I mean, I'm thinking about sort of my own experience of, you know, figuring out what, what is it that I need and how do I communicate that? Like, I think, you know, one of the things during maternity leave, things were really sort of in a fl flowing free form state. Like we didn't have much of a schedule. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have anywhere to go. We didn't have much to do. So we just sort of flowed through it. And I know for myself that I do well with routine. I do well with some sort of you know, like knowing what to expect. And so I'm finding that as I'm starting to work, but we don't yet have full-time childcare that I'm feeling sort of like torn in a lot of places and, and stressed because I don't have my morning routine, which for me includes like working out and meditating and like getting a good breakfast and like sitting down and getting into work. And so I'm finding myself feeling sort of this tension and this pull and I know that it's temporary, but I also know that I need to think about how can I be intentional about asking for that, right? And and creating the space for that um, because I know that then it just affects me and affects how I show up for my husband, for my baby, all of those things and for mm -hmm. myself. Yes, absolutely. So true. So true. Yeah. Yeah. Are there certain things that you do to take care of yourself just that you can share kind of as an example for those listening? Yes. Oh my God. I do so much. <laughs> um, like, cause uh, you know me, I, I fully love this idea of putting myself first. And so um, for people who follow me on Instagram, y'all know I, I, I exercise often because it makes me feel good, but then also for, for my mental health too, honestly, you know, I, I don't feel good when I haven't moved my body each day. And so it sometimes that's yoga. Today, it was taking a really long walk. Sometimes it's strength training, but like really um, making it a habit and, and doing what I need to do to fit it into my daily lifestyle to move my body in some way has been super helpful for me. Um, mm. You know, I think another thing is really being very mindful and intentional about connecting with other people outside of my children and my spouse <laughs> yeah. um, and outside of my coworkers. Like I think sometimes for many of us, we fall into this trap of, oh, I've only talked to my, my spouse, my partner and my kids all day. And then mm. my coworkers, like, so really making space and time for those social connection, that social interaction, um, you know, I was just talking about this on Instagram today. You know, sometimes moms say, well, it's just so hard to make time for that. And so then it just falls mm. off. But we have to make time for that because that's a whole other part of us that really deserves some time. And, you know, for some of us, that's where these virtual communities can step in. You know, yeah, it can be hard to go see your best friend that lives two states away. But guess what? We have virtual communities. We have, mm -hmm. you know, voice messages. I send those all the time to people. There's ways to really connect deeply with other people. Um, so that is something that I'm very intentional about. Um, I think another thing too, and this is just something that I'm really trying to do more this year. And this is just another example. I had a, a annual physical yesterday with my doctor. And so like little things like that, like prioritizing my health means being proactive mm -hmm. about these things that come up with my health. So making sure I'm, I, I schedule that annual visit, even if I don't feel like I need it. You know, making yeah. sure I book that follow up therapy appointment, even if I feel OK today, you know, things like that. Just being very proactive about my physical and my mental health um, has helped me tremendously, too. Yeah, those are such great examples. And I'm sure people are going to hear them and kind of get their wheels turning. It's getting my wheels turning a bit. And I think one of the things that, you know, I take away as I listen to you is that it's not about performance. And I think often we're sort of in a space where self-care sort of 
feels like it's performance. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm supposed to work out. I'm supposed to do this and I'm supposed to do that. And I'm supposed to, and so then people bring that same, again, achievement energy (laughs) into taking care of themselves and then feel stressed that they're not kind of like meeting all the things, right? So the idea isn't that you listen to Dr. Amber and think, oh my gosh, I should be working out every day. And if I'm not working out every day, then I'm not, right? But that you hear her say, this is what makes my body feel good. This is what makes me feel good mentally. And so I make time to move my body in one way or another, Mm -hmm. not to prove that I did it, Mm -hmm. but to say, okay, this is what takes care of me, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's so helpful for people to kind of orient around that getting in tune with what actually feels good with you, not some sort of form or cookie cutter Mm -hmm. thing that somebody else said you should do. Sometimes it can be helpful to try things on like, oh, I heard this is helpful. Try it on, see how it feels for you. But just then tuning in, you know, I had, you mentioned like going out with people. One of my friends earlier this week invited me out for drinks tonight. And at first I was kind of like, no, I'm not going to be able to go. And we have so much going on and I I don't want to, you know, and then I was like, no, I think I do want to go. Yes. And I actually, you know, like, actually, I think I want to go and my husband will be fine. And, you know, and I sort of, of course, checked with him, like, mm-hmm. you know, let's make sure we're not both planning to be out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody has to be with the baby, but, you know, and I'm glad, especially where I am today. I'm like, no, I do kind of need a break and to get out of the house and to do something different. And I'm grateful that I said yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like in those moments, how do you slow down enough to really think through what will be of service to you um, instead of just having an initial, which is sometimes guilt-driven response, like, oh, I can't do that. We're too busy. We have too much going on. It's not going to work. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you know, for me, sometimes too, those reactions, um, I know for a lot of moms, it's guilt. And for other moms, maybe moms like me, it's anxiety. <laughs> mm. um, anxiety often keeps me saying no to things that are really should say yes mm. to because it would be healthy for me to to mm. do the thing or to try something. But for me, I've noticed that as someone who who lives with anxiety, um, I'm often, you know, like you said, oh, oh, I, my automatic response will be no because because of this or no because of that. When really, I, I kind of have to break that down in my head, like, hey, that's that's actually just fear, you know, fear of what will happen, you know, fear of are my kids going to be okay? Fear of will my spouse be okay? Like fear of the unknown, fear of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I often have to push through that anxiety um, that comes up whenever there's something new to try, you know, something to do that's outside of my comfort zone or outside of my routine. So I think guilt and anxiety often keep us really stuck and locked into these things that um, often don't serve us as much as we think. Yeah. I'm so glad you pointed that out about anxiety because I think it's something mm-hmm. that so many of us deal with and struggle with. And the thing is that anxiety can masquerade as like truth, right? Those mm-hmm. thoughts, right? Like it is going to be bad, right? Like if I leave the house, yeah. then she's not going to get to sleep and she's going to be awake or this is going to yeah. be right. Like, and we can then predict the future and think that we know what's going to happen when we really don't, mm-hmm. but we sort of predict this negative future because our anxiety says so. And we say, well, I can't go right? Versus creating a space where we can say, okay, I'm, I can choose to go or not go, but I want for myself to know it's a choice, right? And I can choose to go and know, yeah, maybe the sleep schedule gets a little disrupted, or maybe I have to like pump and dump when I get home because I had drinks or maybe what whatever, or I can choose to stay because today I'm more tired and just the disruptions are going to be more overwhelming than the benefit of spending time with a friend, but bringing it into a space where you're choosing versus letting your anxiety, just like your anxiety or guilt decide for you, I think can be really empowering and help people to feel like, okay, like today I'm choosing that I don't want to go because it just feels too much. And I'm already kind of anxious, but I'm going to make a point to schedule to go another time. And maybe a brunch is an easier time with our family, with the nap schedule, with all those things. So let me ask my friend, let's put a brunch on the, on the schedule and I'm going to make sure to be there. Um, so there are ways to work with it. Absolutely. I agree. Awesome. Are there any final things, pieces of wisdom that you, that you'd like to share or things that you want people to really remember and take away from this conversation? 
Oh, wow. No, I think there were so many gems and nuggets in this episode. I'm, I'm really happy about this conversation, but I think the thing I will remind people is that, you know, if you're a mom, especially if you're a new mom, to just know that every day is not going to be easy. Most days might be hard, you know, but really continue to think about what it is that you want, what it is that you desire, what it is that you need, how to communicate that with other people um, so that you can be all that you need to be for other people, but really for yourself. Mm, yeah. Mm, thank you for that. And thank you for all the wisdom you shared no today. Problem. I'm imagining that a lot of the listeners are going to be curious mm-hmm. about your Balanced Working Mama community and you and the services you offer. So I'd love for you to just share how people can connect with you, learn more about your community and all of that. Yes. Um, well, if anyone who's interested, you can definitely learn more at balancedworkingmama.com. Um, and I'm always on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Amber Thornton. Yeah, she has a great Instagram page. <laughs> you share so authentically. Um, I think that's probably what sound, stands out is that you just share so honestly and authentically. And you, it's clear that you so love your family and that you love yourself and you're kind of showing and modeling. How do I engage with my love for my family and myself as a mom? And it's really wonderful to watch. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. 